Hassan Jamil, Shahidullah Khan Madani, Dr. Hafiz ABM Hezbollah, Akramuz Zaman bin Abdus Salam, Muzaffar bin Mohsin, Muhammadul Hassan, Abdul Razak, Jahangir Alumir Upustaponai. I'm Roger Nygaard from Los Angeles, California, United States. And if you wouldn't mind just starting, let's just start with, would you please tell me your name, your occupation, and your religious affiliation? My name is Dr. Zakir Naik. And by profession, I've been trained as a medical doctor. I've passed my MBBS. But since the past about 15 years, I've been involved in the field of giving lectures and talks on different parts of the world and spreading the truth of the religion. And we have an organization by the name of Islamic Research Foundation. Though I'm a silent partner in my brother's clinic, even my brother's doctor, my father's a doctor. But in the past 15 years, I dedicate my full time as voluntary or as honorary, mainly explain the message of truth. And my main concept is mainly on comparative religion, speaking about Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. So basically, I call myself a student of comparative religion. Do you remember a defining moment when your path changed in this new direction from being a doctor to being a man in search of and, and finding the truth? The main person who inspired me was a person who was originally an Indian, based in South Africa, Sheikh Ahmed Didat. He happens to be a Muslim scholar, was well versed with the Bible, and he talks on Islamic Christianity. So meeting him and seeing his video cassettes, I was inspired. So after meeting him, I got inspired in the field of Islam and comparative religion. Though my parents, my mother and father, wanted me to become a surgeon. And when initially when I got involved in this field, when I told my mother, and she wanted me to become someone like Dr. Chris Barnard. And Dr. Chris Barnard also happens to be one of the surgeons who well, had done the first heart transplant. Uh -huh. The person, the first heart transplant. He happened to be from South Africa also. So when I asked my mother, do you want me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didat or like Dr. Chris Barnard? So she told me both. But now when I tell her that, do you want me to become like Chris Barnard or Sheikh Ahmed Didat, she says that I can sacrifice a thousand Chris Barnard for one Sheikh Ahmed Didat. So he's the person who inspired me into this field. So what is Peace TV and what is the mission of Peace TV? Peace TV, it is a satellite channel. It's a spiritual edutainment channel. Peace means peace. It's there. But you also know that the meaning of the word Islam comes from the Arabic word Salam, which means peace. So basically, peace not to spread peace. It's a spiritual entertainment channel, and the main purpose is to give information to the people about the various different religions, as well as remove the misconception about Islam. So it's a twofold purpose. Number one is to let all the human beings know about the various different religions. Number two is to remove the misconception about Islam. And it is the first channel of its kind in the world. There are thousands of channels in the world out of which several hundreds are on religion. A few hundred on Christianity, Hinduism, yeah, several on Islam. It is the first channel on comparative religion. So basically its main focus is on comparative religion. Talk about Islam and Christianity, Islam and Hinduism, Islam and Buddhism, about secularism and other parts, trying to bring compatibility. And our main focus is rather speak on the similarities rather than the differences. I wish I could get this channel in Los Angeles. At present, uh, we are reaching more than 125 countries in the world. 
We are reaching all the countries in Asia, in Middle East, Australia, Africa, also Europe. But the main platform in Europe is the B-Skyb, which is a very famous platform. We are in the States also. It is a free-to-air channel. Great. Absolutely. All right. I like to start with the biggest question and then work down from there. Sure. So let's dig right in. Why do we, human beings, why do we exist? There's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Dariyat, chapter 51, verse 56, which says that, فَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created the men and the jinn not but to worship him, worship God. So in short, if one line definition is, it is to worship Almighty God. But in detail, if you want, Allah also says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, it is he who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. The reason we are leading this life in this world is a test for the hereafter. And we believe, and most of the religions believe that we come in this world, and after this world there is another life. So the way we lead our life, if we follow the commandments of our Creator, the next life will be successful. And the commandments of the Creator are not to benefit Him. If we pray, it is not for His benefit. In Islam, when we pray, it is for our benefit, for the long term. But every common man may not know what is beneficial for him in the long term. So Almighty God is our creator. He knows what is beneficial for us. So whatever guidance that has been given in the Quran is mainly for our benefit, so that we are successful in this world. So the main reason is that this life is a test for the hereafter. And if we follow the commandments and the will of Almighty God, and if we submit our will to Almighty God, we will be successful in the next life, which is an eternal life. This life is temporary. I want to get back to the afterlife. I'm going to come back to that. What is the greatest danger facing man's existence? One of the greatest dangers is if you ask religiously, and one is otherwise. Religiously, it is the Satan who tries to tempt us. Otherwise, materialism is one aspect in our day-to-day -day life. But if you ask me religiously, it is the Satan whose main role is to tempt the human beings, to take him away from the straight path. And the other danger, what I feel, is one thing materialism, the other thing is people for power, for money. So greed. Greed, yes. Greed. Desire. The conquering that emotion. That's right. Our greatest danger would be an emotion within ourselves. That's right. If I came to you or someone came to you and said, how should I live my life? And you had one sentence to give them a philosophy, what would it be? In brief, in short, one sentence would be submit your will to Almighty God. Now, what is the will of Almighty God? Then you may require an explanation. But in short, if you want to lead your life, submit your will to your Creator. Well, let's, let's get into some theology. Let's talk about sure. God. What is God? Can we define God? Is God male? Is he female? Is he a person? Is he a consciousness? What is, can you define God? That is a very good question. And the best reply that I can give you is quote to you the Quran. Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is God one and only. He is Allah one and only. Allah who samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam li lam yunad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul kufana. There is nothing like him. So the definition of Almighty God who we call in Arabic as Allah is he is one and only. He is absolute and eternal. He begets not nor is he begotten. And there is nothing like him in this world. So anyone, any human being claiming so and so thing is God. If that entity falls in this four-line definition, we Muslims, or I, have got no objection in accepting that entity as Almighty God. In English language, I'm saying, say He is God. But in Islam, Allah has got no gender. Because the language is limited. Therefore, it's a kul hu Allah huad. Say He is Allah. But if you ask me in the concept, there's nothing like Him means Almighty God has got no gender. He's neither female, neither male. But because of lack of the knowledge, when I'm translating, Allah as God, which is not the right translation, but that's what we understand in English. So God is He. If I say God is, I have to say She. I say that God is not the correct translation of Allah. Because God is an English word which can be manipulated. If I add S to God, it becomes God's. Allah is the Arabic word which is unique. There's nothing like God's. Allah is only one. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning female God. In Islam, Allah is neither male nor neither female. There is no male Allah, no female Allah. Allah is unique. If I add the word Father to God, it becomes Godfather, He is my Godfather, He is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father in Islam. 
if i had mother to god becomes god mother is nothing like allah mother nisun therefore god is a word which is not the correct translation of the arabic word allah but because of limitation of the language i'm using this word because you may not understand it right but god is not the correct translation the right word is arabic word allah which to define these four lines are there it's fascinating so if god is infinite he had no creation and no creator but was no, there a time he has no creation sorry he was not created but he has created so he's he, the creator he himself or god allah hmm? had no creation has no creator he has existed infinitely that's right but there was a time before we were created and there must have been a time before self awareness even for god existed is there have you ever considered that concept what allah was like before we were created before there was even the big bang before everything what was the state of god or allah then see allah existed since time immemorial when we were created before that he existed before the universe now what is the state of god before that it is the same definition what self awareness he got our logic doesn't reach that level how does he look we don't know but after dying there are hadith which say we would crave to see the face of allah but now if you ask me there nothing compares the moment i tell you god is like this then he is not allah in other religions we can say he is like this in islam the moment i tell you for example someone says that almighty god is 1000 times stronger than arnold schwarzenegger arnold schwarzenegger most powerful person mr universe the moment i compare him to anyone whether it be arnold schwarzenegger whether it be dara singh king kong whether it be 1000 times or million times he cannot be god the question you ask me what was he i cannot describe so it's sort of beyond our comprehension it's beyond our human comprehension পরে সম্মানে রক্ষা দূর করে হতাশা দেই তাকে অধিকার মিটিয়ে দেই निराशा আমি মোহাম্মদ বদরুদ্দ জান আদুই আপনারা দেখছেন পিস টিভি বাংলা ইসলাম নারীকে দিয়েছে কত উচ্চ স্থান মান ও সম্মান তা জানতে হলে দেখুন ইসলামে নারীর অধিকার দেখুন ইসলামে নারীর মর্যাদা কাল সন্ধ্যা পাঁচটায় বাপ পুনঃসম্প্রচার রাত বারোটায় বাংলাদেশে পিস টিভি বাংলায় মানবতার জন্য করুণা স্বরূপ महान अल्लाह मोहम्मद सल्लाम के समस्त विश्वर रहमत बनिए पाठाल शांति दूत कल सन्दा साढ़े पांच टाइन सम्प्रचार सकाल छाए बांगल मीन is there a connection is there a flow back and forth of love between man and god love is something which god has put like for example god said that in surah rum chapter 30 verse 21 he has put love between the hearts of the men and women that's different one is the right word that is you have mentioned that allah says in the quran in surah hijr chapter 15 verse 29 he says that he has blown his spirit he has put the knowledge of almighty god in every human being so every human being has the knowledge he may accept not a different so he has put the knowledge of god in every human being what we say what love the arabic word that we use is taqwa called as god consciousness and we believe in tawhid the oneness of allah subhanahu wa taala right what is taqwa that is a god consciousness about piety 
That's called righteousness. So every human being has that link between God, even if he's an atheist. Like there was so well done that those who don't believe in religion, when something happens, they say, my God. So though they don't believe in religion, but they say, my God. So this is spontaneous. This is by nature. So what we believe that our beloved prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, that every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. Deen al-Fitr means he's born in the innate religion. He's born as submitting his will to Almighty God. How do you realize submit will to Almighty God? So we believe every human being is born as a Muslim. Muslim does not mean label Zakir, Abdullah, Sultan. Muslim means a person who submits will to Almighty God. So every human being when he's born, he's born as a Muslim. Later on he's influenced by his parents, by his teachers, by his elders. He may start doing fire worship, he may start doing idol worship, and he may go to the wrong path. Therefore, the right word for a person who is a non-Muslim and accepts Islam, the right word is revert, it's not convert. Because everyone is born as a Muslim. Muslim means he submits will to Almighty God. His heartbeat is working into the way of Almighty God. He's breathing into the way of Almighty God. Later on, he's influenced by others, by parents, elders, preachers. And to prove this point, there was a survey done that on two groups of people, the Australian Aborigines and the Kapauku tribe. Who have never been introduced. Never been in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. When researchers went and tried to find out what was their way of life, it was everything the same, that God is one, there are no idols of God, they prostrated to worship that God. So in terminology, in Arabic, they were Muslim but not by name. So they were submitting the will to Almighty God, but the name wasn't there, the label wasn't there, whether it be Abdullah, whether it be Sultan or Muhammad. So when we realized that if no external influence is got onto any human being when he's born, and if he's isolated, he will follow the innate religion that is submitting to Almighty God, which we call as Islam. Right. Do you have a certainty within you about your belief in Allah? And if so, where does it come from? And do you ever have doubts? And if you have doubts, how do you or how should someone deal with doubt? One thing around certainty, I always say in my talks that, fine, I was a Muslim. Because my parents were Muslim, till the age of about 19, 20. 21. Later on when I read about the Quran and about other scriptures after reading the Bible, after reading the Vedas, about the Buddhist scripture, the Mahapad, Jainism, then there is a logical certainty for sure. And I say in my talk that if anyone can get me a better way of life than what I am following, what is prescribed in the Quran, I am ready to change immediately. Why? Because I am a student of compact religion. I call myself a student of compact religion and I have read the other scriptures. Not that other people aren't certain, but the certainty in me is a different certainty. Some people, they read a thing and they know it is right. I have decided in the Quran, I have read the other scriptures. And when I say that if you can get me a better way of life, I'm ready to change, some people may think that means the person is not sure. Actually, I am 100% sure. I'm so sure that I'm ready to put the head on my guillotine. You know, that is the thing. I'm so sure that therefore, it's must be somebody the Muslim will say, Zakir says he will leave his religion if someone convinces him a better religion. That means he's not sure. Actually, I'm convinced logically. And Islam is based on, though it's based on Quran and Hadith, but it's also based on reason, logic, and science. It's a logical religion. It's a scientific religion. It's not based on science, but because the Quran is scientific. Quran is logical. It's not a book of science. There's not a single statement in the Quran which goes against established scientific facts. So that is the reason I'm being a medical doctor. I'm convinced and my main reason to become a doctor was to serve humanity, which I initially thought that doctor is the best profession, which it is. But then I found a better profession that's conveying the message of truth. So from a doctor of a body, I became a doctor of the soul. Good. So who are these other wise men throughout history? Uh, you named some in your speech today, but Jesus, of course, the Buddha, uh, Confucius, and then of course, Muhammad. How do they all fit in? See, as far as uh, you realize that there's a difference between if you know about the world religions. Broadly, they're divided into Semitic and non-Semitic, if you know. The Semitic religions are Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and non-Semitic. Non-Semitic are further divided into Aryan and non-Aryan religions. Aryan religions, one based on the Veda, Hinduism, those which are non-Vedic religion, Buddhism, Jainism, etc., and your Zoroastrianism. Then you have the non-Aryan religions. Now religion by definition actually means, according to Oxford Dictionary, a belief in a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So for a religion to exist, 
there has to be God. If God is not, the religion can't exist. So the non-Aryan religions, most of them, they are ethical systems based on origin. Shintoism, Taoism, Confucianism coming from Japan, coming from China. So in my speeches I say, they are more of ethical systems rather than religions. There's a difference. For a religion, there has to be God, according to Oxford Dictionary. If no God means can't be a religion. Clear? So Confucianism, Taoism, Shintoism, they are more of ethical systems. Though if you see a dictionary of religion, you'll find them. It's ethical systems, rather though they put in religions. But actually, technically, they are not. So in terms of religious people, as far as where is the common thread? If you see in the Semitic religions, those people coming from Semites, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the common thread is there. The prophets that are believed by the Jews are supposed to be believed by the Muslims, compulsory. But as far as Christianity and Judaism is concerned, Christianity believes in one more prophet called as Jesus, peace be upon him. In Islam, we believe in all the prophets of Judaism, as well as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, but when the additional last and final prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So by name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the Quran, starting from Adam, peace be upon him, which is the first prophet, even in Judaism and Christianity. Then we have various messengers coming down the line, a prophet Nu, then we have Abraham, you have Moses, you have Jesus, you have Muhammad, peace be upon them all. So by name, 25 messengers have been mentioned in the Quran. But the Quran also says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse 24, that for Immin Ummat in Allah There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a messenger or a warner. So every nation has been sent a warner. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the Quran. But every nation has been sent a messenger. Messenger, the main role is to get them closer to the commandments of Almighty God. So the common thread is there in the Semitic religions. That's very Judaism, well explained. Yeah. Very, very... Non-Semitic religion also there is, but it's not as clear as that. There has been a lot of research done as far as Christianity and Judaism and Islam is concerned. As far as compared religions are concerned. You will find many books on Islam and Christianity, many, hundreds and thousands. You will hardly find any book that does comparison between the Semitic and the Aryan religions. So one of the main researches that we have done in a foundation is Islam and Hinduism and Islam and other religions. In this, I've given the talk and shown common thread even there, but this is very well known to the world, all the names are also matching. In this, it's a different lineage which we can discuss if you want. I mentioned, I asked a question earlier today about the multiple religions, and you, you, I like your definition of religion very much. Should religious ideas be challenged? What role does skepticism play? Islam, the Quran, encourages asking questions. Encourages asking questions. And there are 332 times it said in the Quran that they asked. And 332 times Quran says, cool. When they ask, tell them. So Quran is somewhat sort of a question answer book also. When the Quran was being revealed, people asked questions to the Prophet and he gave the reply, but naturally the revelation. So, you have full right to question in terms of logic. But those who have faith, for example, after verifying everything, then we realize that there has to be a yardstick. You cannot question the yardstick. You can verify the yardstick. So once you verify a yardstick, then you cannot question the yardstick. So first you verify where is the yardstick. Like you verify the yardstick, the ruler is right or not. Once you verify, then once you get the answer, then you can't say, Are, is it right or wrong? So first you verify which is a yashtik. So our yashtik is the Quran. So other people can surely question. I love people asking questions. I love people attacking the Quran. But when they attack, when they get the answer, they get convinced. But once I've got convinced, then that is my yashtik. So if, if, if your answer is good, you shouldn't be afraid of a challenging question. No, not at all. So therefore I said that if anyone proves to me a religion better than Islam, I'm ready to change, that means I'm confident. But if you ask me personally, which is the ultimate? For me, ultimate is the Quran. So if someone gets a question against the Quran, I will try and prove it logically. What is the logical answer? And I tell that there is not a single verse in the Quran which goes against established science. No, Quran is not a book of science. But it's a book of signs. S-I-G-N-S. -S. More than 6,000 signs in the Quran are there. Out of these, more than 1,000 speak about science. S-C-I-N-C. -S Albert Einstein said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. 
right? But Quran is not a book of science, it's a book of signs. But because I'm a medical doctor, and because Quran is a logical book, it's a scientific book, it's not a book of science, there is not a single verse in the Quran which will go against established science. There were verses which people thought were against science, but those are hypotheses. Hypothesis. There are hypotheses that the world is flat, which Quran doesn't agree with that. But that was a hypothesis, not a scientific fact. So the difference between a scientific fact and hypothesis, for example, heart pumps blood is a scientific fact. However much science advances, we'll come to know more about the heart, but heart will not pump blood, liver will not pump blood. So science and religion can coexist. It has to coexist. Scientific facts, not hypothesis. Please note. There's a difference between scientific theory, a scientific hypothesis, it's one category, and a scientific fact. Religion cannot go against scientific fact, if it is a true religion. Let's talk a little bit about the harm that religion can do. Re religion can do many good things, obviously. It's helped countless people in their lives with a way of living and, and, and a belief system, and it's made them happy, and it brought them joy. What about the harm? Why, how can it, sometimes it's used for harm. The thing is there that can religion do harm? Actually, if you understand the religion correctly, religion cannot do harm. But because of misunderstanding of the religion, there can be a lot of harm done. And today, one of the maximum harms done in the world, whether it be India, whether it be Western countries, it is in the name of religion. If you understand religion correctly, religion tends to get the people together to understand the Creator better. It tends to bring peace. All the religions, I'm not talking about Islam only. The basic concept of all religions is to get peace. And Islam means peace. But unfortunately, what the people, the so-called scholars, inverted commas, I would say inverted commas, they utilize religion for the ulterior motives. And they quote things out of context many a time. And they deviate people from the truth for the ulterior motives. It may be the politicians. It may be the people around you. So therefore I say to understand the religion, go back to your scripture. Any scholar says anything of any religion. Don't blindly follow until you check up the scripture. लोकार अपनर संपद के शुरुआत तो नारक तो पड़े, विनियोग अपनर संपद के नाबित दिक्कत तो पड़े, किंतु जकात दिले निश्चय अपनर संपद बाढ़ बे थक बे शुरुआत तो एवं कुवित्रो। बीस डीबीर शाते था कून अपनर जकात तो दानी रोक तो पड़ते पड़े न। आईआरएफआई अल्ट्रायन बैंक क्वाड्रेंट कोर्ट आठ � पाउंड अकाउंट नंबर शून्य एक एक तीन दो ही तीन शून्य एक आई बैंड जी बी बांडो एल ओ वाई डी तीन शून्य नौ छः तीन चार शून्य एक शून्य दो ही चार एक नौ दो ही शॉट कोड तीन शून्य 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 आठ तीन स्वेप बी आई सी कोड आई बी ओ बी जी बी बाईश टाका पाची आमदर ईमेल करूँ एडमिन एट कुरानेर दृष्टि कुरानेर दृष्टि हादी सहर भित्ति के सहर एक दिन आकाश फिटे चोची रहे जब धुआं पूर्वों दिखते के बेर हो बे मारिये मेरे छेले ईशाले सलाम आवार ने बे आते हैं दाज्जलेर कॉपले रूपोरे का फा राली खतक बे मने दाज्जल काफे मानुष बेसी बेसी नेशा दर द्रुब्बो पान कर बे देख उठे जावे पुरुष कोमे जावा, नारी बेशी होए जावा, मानुष नीर दीदाई तर पीता के होते करते, त्याग मतिर अनेक लोग खोन। जाना जन्नो देखून, शायद खबदुर राज्य के साथ है कि आमतेर आलमों। आज रात शारे दोष्टाएं आपुनो शंप्रचार, शौकल नौटाएं बांग्लादेशे, बीस टीवी बांग्लाएं।